question. Will we be uh, unable to use Visual Studio for the final uh, project? Thing? For the lab? final sort of lab today? Uh, that is correct. So potentially anyone who wants to work on Windows, I do have a copy of the final binary to, uh, I have it in my transfer folder. I ported it to Windows. The problem is uh, Visual Studio is not so great uh, for debugging. I guess it maybe can, but I've never actually tried. Uh, but I don't believe it's going to be appropriate for debugging like a straight up binary. And that's what I'm going to be giving you at the very end. Straight up binary with no source. So if I gave you the source for this final binary, it would defeat the entire point of figuring out what the inputs would be, right? So Visual Studio is good for debugging source and uh, binary at the same time, but I want to give you just straight up binary. So if you have previous experience with Windows, you can use whatever tools you want, IDA Pro, WinDebug, OliDebug, anything like that. Uh, otherwise, I'd say most people, we should uh, stick with GDB for now, just so that everyone's on the same page and I can wander around and help people out, et cetera. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so in, in so the reason I ported the binary to Windows is because ideally I would have liked to let people choose, do you want to do Windows or do you want to do uh, Linux? But what I found is that I can't shoehorn in enough description of WinDebug and all of its commands because every debugger has its own completely different commands. So, uh, you know, if you're definitely interested in doing Windows at the end, I since I'm going to try to get there faster today. Uh, we can potentially do some wind debug, but otherwise it's probably best to just use GDB because it's really less about what tool you're using and more about understanding the code and figuring out uh, what are the inputs it's asking for. How do I change these conditional jumps so that it goes one way where it, you know, succeeds, right? So, anyways, <coughs> part four. All right, lots of fun stuff here. Okay, so let's talk about inline assembly first. So inline assembly, right, now you've had plenty of experience looking at assembly. Now potentially you might want to write some of your own assembly, right? Uh, and like I said before, I think I said before, maybe think of the previous class, there are definitely things in kernel mode where if you're writing a kernel mode driver, you have to write inline assembly because there's registers for which there is no C way to access them. You literally just have to write an assembly instruction that says, you know, I want to move this value to a control register. I want to move this value to a debug register, right? You know, you can, you, you know, implicitly when you write regular C code, yes, it'll be touching your regular registers, EAX, EBX, CCX, et cetera, right? But it's not going to, like, implicitly change stuff on control registers, things like that. C has no notion of x86 control registers, right? So therefore, in some cases, you have to write this inline assembly. Uh, other cases I've found are where I've, well, I'll get to there when I get there. And I think I mentioned yesterday as well uh, when Ariel was asking about like shifting left and shifting right, things like that. So I th said there is like this roll instruction, which is like a bit shift where whatever comes off one side goes back on to the other side potentially. Uh, and those are used in cryptography frequently. Well, not frequently, occasionally. Uh, and so if you're writing some crypto library and you want to use roll within, you know, if roll is a part of your actual, you know, algorithm, within uh, the crypto, then you have no way of generating that. I, I think technically you can generate it through playing some, like using your shifts and like using the right kind of shifts and things like that. I think it is technically still possible to do it, but I don't know for sure because I never tried. So, and you know, maybe you think you're smarter than the compiler and you're gonna, you went through and you read the optimization guideline and therefore you know best the, what you need to do with your assembly. So go ahead and Write it for that as well. But uh, really, the big reason why I like having inline assembly in here is you can go back, take GCC, take, take Visual Studio, and, you know, just put in simple instructions and, like, see what happens. So you can write a small sequence of instructions in order to do something like, say you want to find out, you know, what was, say you want, like, just a program which prints out the instruction pointer that's saved on the stack, right? How would you do that? So you can do that. You probably need to read EBP plus four. That's where that saved instruction pointer is, right? Move that into some register. And then potentially we'll see there's syntax to move a register into like a C variable. But a C variable is really just an EBP minus something else, right? So you could just take EBP plus four, move it into a very move it into a register, and then move that into EBP minus four, or just push it and then call printf or something like that, right? So why even put it into a local variable? 
read EBP plus four, push it, call printf. There you go. You have a program now which uh, all you did was two assembly instructions and, uh, well, I don't know that the printf, the syntax wouldn't work, so you'd have to still use an assembly call as well. So three assembly instructions. All right. <clears throat> so we've got uh, the different, uh, different compilers slash assemblers are going to require their assembly in different formats. So Visual Studio being a Intel syntax kind of place. Uh, you're going to put your inline assembly basically as a sequence of uh, single Intel syntax instructions separated by a new line, right? So one on a line, move it down, do another line, right? So, and specifically there's underscore, underscore ASM, curly brackets, and then your sequence of instructions, close curly brackets, and then a semicolon where the semicolon is not strictly necessary, but it's good for keeping your syntax tab of highlighting and all that good, so just put it there. So underscore, underscore, ASM, curly brackets, sequence of instructions, and yes, you can even put like labels and stuff in here if you want. That makes it much easier, right? Rather than doing a jump E, you know, plus some number of bytes, it's actually, pr it's not really possible to do within the constraints of this inline assembler. It won't let you do like jump E, you know, jump if equal, you know, five bytes forward or something like that. Like if you put jump if equal five, the assembler is going to say, aha, you want it to jump to address five, right? So in some of these cases, you have to use trickery to get the right kind of instruction that you want. So anyways, this is the syntax for inline assembly. You can write any sort of small little program inside your C program, and it's a good way to just experiment with things. Right? And, you know, Visual Studio's inline assembly for dealing with uh, C variables to go from a to go from, you know, you've got your little snippet of assembly and you want to put that into something that C can then manipulate and you just want to do the rest in C. It's nice and easy. Just do something like move EAX to my var, something like that. And so, or move, you know, my var to EAX. So you can get into and out of registers. Very simple. Just specify the C variable name. Right? Uh, but the thing you need to know is that my var, like what are, what are variables behind the scenes? There, EBP minus something. And if you're going to move EAX, whatever's in EAX, into this variable, strictly speaking, right, the variable is in memory at EBP minus something. So the address of my var is EBP minus four, but the memory there is, you know, you're behind the scenes, this is actually generating some sort of RM32, right? Because you're trying to store it in memory at the location for my variable uh, in memory. And so behind the scenes, this is more like a move EAX into EBP minus four in an angle brackets, right? So that's why, for instance, you can't like use inline assembly to go move my var one to my var two because those are two um, memory things behind and that would be a memory to memory move. And then also sometimes you have to play little tricks with, you know, you can't do like long strings of CD referencing and things like that, right? So you can't do like, you know, a dot var one, like remember when we had those structs before, you can't put like move EAX into A dot var two of three or something like that because that's actually, right, we've seen when you access something like A dot var two of three, it's a sequence of assembly instructions all like just itself, right? First you get the base of the thing, then you get the offset, then you write into memory, right? So you can do simple little things like memory to register, register to memory right here. But uh, you don't don't be trying to throw huge long C. You know I know that my variable is actually this sub variable of this struct inside of another struct, etc. So simple variables only, please. All right. GCC assembly syntax, inline assembly syntax, AT&T syntax, as we would kind of expect, because the assembler and the behind the scenes is expecting it. Um, and so here we have ASM, just ASM, no underscore underscore like the previous one. ASM. Uh, parentheses, and then we have quotes around each of these uh, instructions, and we even have uh, the slash n new line like explicitly stated in these if you want to do uh, more than one within a single ASM thing, right? So if you don't want the slash n, you can just do ASM and then a single instruction between quotes, and then do another ASM, parentheses, single instruction between quotes, but uh, because what the compiler is essentially going to do with this is the compiler is going to take this and it's going to grab that and it's going to 
you know, it's going to maybe generate, so sometimes it'll, sometimes it'll treat it like its own little thing and it like won't think about that with respect to the rest of the assembly generated on each side and it'll literally just take that blob of assembly and pass it to the back end assembler. And other times the assembler will treat that as, you know, contiguous within some other stream of assembly and it'll compensate for variables and things like that. So, anyways, this is just the syntax, ASM, parentheses, quotes, and a slash n if you want to have multiple assembly instructions in the same ASM uh, chunk. All right. Now, this is where it gets a bit nasty. Um, this is called the extended assembly syntax for if you want to do something like we just saw in Visual Studio where you put a register into memory, into a C variable. So if we're going into and out of C variables, you're now forced to use this extended, uh, extended ASM syntax. And the syntax here is ASM, parentheses, assembler template. This is kind of like a quoted, potentially it acts like a format string kind of thing. Okay, so think of it kind of like a format string. And then these other things at the end are kind of like parameters to that format string. So you've got output operands. So if you have something here, then something in that format string can potentially say whatever is here in the format string, that's going to go into output operand 1 or output operand 2, etc. And then you may have another format specifier that says, you know, my input operands here I'm going to put into this format string. So anyways, it's all very nice and ugly. List of collaborative registers. This is what you're saying, like, I want to, um, these are the registers which I know I'm going to be destroying so that uh, the assembler can keep that in mind relative to the stuff on either side. So. All right, so again, simple. Say we have an int my var in C. Now, if I want to move the value from my var into a register, here's what I have. So now, all of a sudden, we have double, uh, double, uh, percent signs, and this is what I have against percent signs I knew before. You know, so a normal assembly instruction in Intel or uh, AT&T syntax, we have a single percent sign in front of it, right? Now this double percent sign is trying to say like, okay, this is just a normal EAX. Don't treat it like anything special. But a single percent sign here for this percent sign zero, this is saying take my zeroth parameter from you know, my output operands or my input operands or something like that. So take something from one of these and put that in here. So it's like saying, okay, well, what's my, you know, which, which side is this? This is my output parameter, right? So I'm doing, I'm trying to do a move EAX into my var, right? So Intel syntax EAX is on the left, move that to the right, trying to put EAX into my var. Percent zero is saying replace this percent zero with my var, right? Because I've got this, this uh, output operand over here. And so we need to like figure out, so behind the scenes, the assembler has to figure out like what is the output operand and like it's again going to, you know, really it's going to do like EBP minus four or something like that, right? It's going to treat that like an RM32. It's going to stick that in there. It's going to generate move EAX RM32 EBP minus four, right? But there's just this great syntactical way that you have to specify this. And you need this little equal sign because that's, that's like saying equals this register is going into this memory location and whatever. And then on the other hand, like if you're trying to take input from the variable, well now I have colon colon. So this, this thing right here in the middle, that, so we have colon output operands, right? and then colon input operands. So there's nothing in my output operands here. I'm trying to take input, but I still have to have colon colon to separate and say, okay, the first colon, the stuff after that is the output operands. The second colon, the stuff after that is the input operands. Okay, so I have no output operands. I have only input operands. And that says, take this my var, put it into this percent zero, and I'm trying to move from my var to EAX. It's a literal EAX because it's got double percent signs. So there you go pain in the ass if you try to do anything complicated in this syntax. Typically, you end up just wanting to know behind the scenes, okay, you know, this is, you know, my var is, you know, EBP minus four. I'm just going to go find that out myself and just write the assembly instruction, right? Okay, I declared A and then I declared B, so B must be EBP minus eight, something like that. You'll find yourself not wanting to use 
C variables, basically. All right? So, fabulous. <clears throat> All right. Now, these are kind of useful in some cases. So this gets into that notion that we had before, where there is some sequence of bytes which are interpreted as instructions, right? Different bytes correspond to different instructions. So instead of doing inline assembly, in some cases, you may want to know, or you may find that I cannot get the assembler to generate the exact form of the instruction I want, right? You, so you went to the manual and you said, you looked through and you said, oh, call absolute indirect. Okay, well, I want to call, you know, RM32 EAX or something like that, right? And then you try to put that in and you, you put like call and then you put brackets and you put EAX and if that doesn't work for some reason, you know, you fight with it for a while, you try different syntax variations, whatever. If you ultimately come up with something where you can't get the assembler to generate the exact instruction you wanted, then what you need to do is basically hard code the bytes for that assembly instruction. And so I found this, for instance, like there was one time when Visual Studio wouldn't let me set one control register, but it would let me set another. So I could like do just a move. It was very simple. It was like move uh, to control register one from EAX or something like that. And like it was fine with that. But if I changed control register one to control register zero, it was like, no, I don't know about that instruction. But it's like the exact same instruction, just a different variant, right? So I had to like hard code the bytes for what is this actual, you know, variant of the same instruction. And then other times, uh, well, there was another case I can't remember at the moment, though. So. Oh, right. So uh, we may see it later, and we definitely see it in life of binaries, because I'm working on the virus for that right now, and I had to use this for the virus, and the virus isn't working, and it sucks. But anyways, uh, there's like this, this form of, like, so, okay, for instance, that jump negative two that we talked about before, like that infinite loop, so jump two backwards. Uh, I feel like, no, maybe that one that is easy to do. So it's more like a call zero. So if I want to call zero bytes from the next instruction forward, and so I call to the next instruction because it's zero bytes offset from the next instruction. So call zero is not something I've been able to get the assembler to generate for me in the past. So I just hard code the bytes for that. Anyways, so you have an emit and byte. So emit is the Visual Studio version and dot byte is the GCC version. So if I do underscore underscore ASM and then I put in that underscore emit hex 55, that hex 55 behind the scenes is actually push EBP. So push EBP is actually a one byte instruction specified by the byte 55. And I can also do something like, you know, I can just take two of those. I can put two of those in sequence and then, you know, I'll emit byte 89 and then E5 and the sequence 89E5 is move ESP to EBP, right? So your typical, if you looked at the bytes behind your typical function prologue, you'd see 55, then 89, uh, 89E5. So proving that. Oops, that's not it. So remember we had our obj-dump. obj-dump dash d for disassemble. By example 2, s, right? First two instructions. We've just elided the fact thus far, but the actual byte sequence for that instruction is 55. That's the push EBP. 89 E5, that's the move EBP to ESP, right? So there's some sequence of instructions behind the scenes. If you find that you want to generate an exact instruction sequence, you like, I want this instruction, go ahead and hard code those bytes with an emit or a dot byte. So different syntax for the same thing. In a, so in the ASM one, at least the dot byte, you can put a bunch of those all in the same ASM block. All right. So now comes the fun part because I've repeatedly misled you and it's time to read the fun manual. So this is by definition the fun part. <clears throat> okay, so at this link, that's where the actual uh, Intel manuals are. Uh, just the high level overview is that volume one is just kind of a summary of a lot of stuff. And this is actually where I really like to like 
bring up, you know, my stack of manuals like this big. But uh, we're going to just be looking at the PDFs instead because I'm not bringing those with me on the plane. All right, so volume one is the summary, just kind of like high level for a bunch of stuff for all of x86. Volumes two A and B, those are like all the detailed explanations of all the instructions. And we said, you know, in this class we've learned what however many, 24, 27, something like that instructions. Uh, if you want, yeah, so it looks like 24. You know, if you want to see all the various instructions which do, you know, one little specific thing, you can go look at 2A and 2B to find those. And then 3A and 3B, that's all sorts of extra good stuff about, you know, how virtual memory works, how segmentation works. That's stuff we get into in the intermediate class. But then also, you know, the MMX instructions. Remember back in the day when Intel had their bunny rabbit dancing bunnies, MMX commercials? That's in there. It's on the manual. The virtual machine in, uh, extensions, right? So when we say that, you know, nowadays x86 hardware has hardware support for virtualization, right? There's a bunch of extra instructions they've added which manage and modify certain VM control blocks and stuff like that. And so you can go into the manual and you can read up on how you create your own virtual machine, your own hypervisor essentially, right, in order to manage virtual machines. So. You know, all of that implementation, all the things you would need to know how to implement something like a, um, you know, VMware or uh, Parallels or whatever else, it's all just in the Intel manual. And then 64, 16 bit modes, et cetera. So, all right. So now we're going to quick see a little bit of uh, description of how you read the manual pages for something like, um, or just regular instruction, right? So I've given you my description of what the end instruction is, but now we're going to go and see what the manual describes it and how you interpret its description of the manual. And so you actually have to read the manual to read the manual. There is this section 2A, section 3.1. I mean, it could be a different number in your versions, but you have to read that first and that'll tell you how to interpret the rest, but I'm going to give you my little summary. So <coughs> here's a simple instruction that we know is pretty easy, right? And instruction. And here I said, you can have destination operand can be an RM32 or a register. And the source can be an RM32, a register, or an immediate, right? So we've got some combination of these other than you can't have RM32 and RM32. This is what the Intel manual says, right? So there's a bunch of different forms and you have to be able to know how to come in here and say, you know, what am I looking for? Like I want to move an immediate to, you know, an immediate to EAX or I want to move an immediate to just any arbitrary memory, something like that. And then once you find the form that you want, then you, you can figure out like what bytes it requires, et cetera. So we'll go through this uh, kind of line by line. So the first thing, you know, just slicing this down to a little subsection of the very beginning of the manual page, we have uh, what looks like four different versions of the assembly and instruction dealing with different sizes. So we have an immediate, whatever. But this last fourth one, we're not going to care about that. That's the 64-bit size. This is using this RAX. That's the 64-bit version of EAX. So we're not going to care about any of this because it's 64-bit. So cancel that out. And so now we're going to focus on these first what look like three forms, but which are actually kind of two forms, but which are actually kind of three forms. All right. So the first column uh, is the opcode column. So this is where I said, you know, the behind the scenes, there's going to be some sequence of bytes which actually specifies uh, how you encode an instruction, right? So for, this, for these AND things, they either start with 24 or 25, and then they're either followed by an immediate byte, this IB, immediate byte, or an immediate word, or an immediate D word. So I said before, immediates are those numbers which are hard-coded into the instruction string. So I could see like 24, so I guess I say right here, if I saw, if, if like the very first thing in my instruction stream was 24, and then I saw 25, you know, I would think this is an AND 25 with AL, something like that, right? Because this immediate byte is being ANDed with AL. I'm skipping ahead, but I'll get there. So, 
this is just saying when you see a 24, you should expect one byte immediately after that because that's an immediate byte. And if you see a 25 as the first byte, it could be two bytes next or it could be four bytes next. And we'll talk about which it is and why it would be either one of those next. Yeah, so I guess I talked about it already. All right, so here's the problem, right? We have ambiguity. If I'm a disassembler and I'm walking down my instruction stream and the very first instruction I get to starts with 25, okay, I know it's an end instruction. But how do I know whether the next two bytes or the next four bytes are still part of this instruction, right? Is this instruction three bytes long or is it five bytes long? Right? I don't know just based on this because it's saying, well, 25 can either specify ending with two bytes or ending with four bytes. And so the, uh, the simple explanation which I'll give, basically, which I think we get a little more detailed in the next class, the simple explanation is basically this version right here, this 25 with the two byte version, that was the original 16 bit version when Intel was still a 16 bit processor, right? And so nowadays we're 32 bits. And so when, this, when the processor is running in 32 bit mode, you should be expecting this 25 to be interpreted like a 32 bit immediate afterwards. So if the processor is 32 bit mode, treat the resulting immediate like a 32. Otherwise, if the processor is in 16-bit mode, treat the next thing like it's going to be 16 bits. And so when the processor restarts, for instance, if you reboot your CPU, processor starts in the 16-bit mode, and that's kind of like what uh, DOS and things like those ran in. But then eventually the operating system bootstraps itself into a 32-bit mode, and that's what Windows runs in. So this is my, you know, high-level, wishy-washy kind of explanation, but you should just think that like in a normal operating system, it's bootstrapped itself into 32-bit mode and only like immediately after something's rebooted is it in 16-bit mode. So whether it's 16 or 32, that's how, the, uh, that's how the processor interprets these. And then basically as far as the disassembler is interpreting it, right, if you're IDA Pro, you basically just have to ask the user when they start it, you say, do you want me to interpret this as if it were 16-bit assembly, like as if the processor was in 16-bit mode? Or do you want me to interpret this like a 32-bit assembly? And most of the time, you know, you're looking at Windows binaries. Windows runs in 32-bit mode, so usually you're disassembling at 32. Therefore, IDA would come along, see, you know, 25, and it would know the next four bytes, that's going to be an immediate, and now I'm going to go to the next byte after those four bytes and find out whatever instruction that is next. That's kind of how a disassembler would disambiguate that. They basically leave it on you and say, what do you want me to do? You want to pretend we're in 32-bit mode or pretend we're in 16-bit mode because we're not actually running if we're disassembling, right? We're just trying to interpret. The CPU knows what mode it's in, so the CPU knows which way it's going to interpret it. <clears throat> All right. So uh, if you want to see, you know, the code bytes and things like that, in Visual Studio, when, uh, when you're in disassembly mode, you can, like, right-click and we had those th options like, you know, show symbol names, and I had us turn off symbol names at one point. You can also go ahead and show code bytes, and then that'll show you if you have push EVP, that's 55. If you have move ESP to EVP, move EVP to ESP, never remember that. See, this is the problem with AT&T syntax. It just, if you know there's this one way and the other way, you can't, like, always just think of something like one way. So, if you move... ESP to EVP, that's going to be that 8985. All right. And I can't find a good way in uh, GDB to actually show the code bytes. So typically what I do, so if you use, so one way you can do that is just use obsdump, right? So obsdump did it. You just have a copy of obsdump off to the side. That'll show you the code bytes. Otherwise, if you're actually like in GDB at the time, I would do something like, okay, well, here's main's address, and I want to see, you know, what the code bytes are for uh, e push EVP. The problem is, if I do this, I don't know, like, how big it is, right? So I can do x slash 5 hex byte, and then, like, the address of main or something like that. Okay, and that shows me five bytes, right? And I know there's five bytes there, but I don't know that, like, the first byte is the push EVP, and the second two bytes are, you know, that. So 
there's probably a way, I just don't know it, how to uh, show the, so I've looked it up and they, I've seen ways that it says should work, but they never work. I guess this is a new VM, so I should go look it up again and see if it works with this one. But anyways, that's what Outage Dump's for. Except for those of you who uh, have to do the hard version of the lab later. Outage Dump will help you not. Mm. No, it will, unless you do the extra hard version. So. All right. Anyways. All right. So that's the first column, opcode. Right? The actual opcode is just, you know, this first part of the byte, and then we're saying then there's going to be some extra bytes tacked onto it. Instruction, this is sort of like how you as a human interpret uh, this thing, like what it's going to be displayed as uh, by a disassembler or, you know, a debugger, et cetera. And so this is what we've been looking at thus far. Instruction is just something like, so you fill in this immediate 32, for instance, right? So it's going to be and EAX and then, you know, 0x, FFFF, 1, 2, 3, whatever. So it could be either like that or it could be, you know, a one byte version and AL and then X, FF or something. And this RM32 that I've been talking about thus far, if you don't see it here, right, but when we expand our view of the manual page, the RM32 comes from this column, basically. You'll see RM32 in this column, and that'll be your little uh, key indicator to say this value, which could be on this side of the instruction, could be, you know, memory or a register for that format that we talked about. 64-bit mode column, we don't care about this because we don't care about 64-bit, but it's just telling you whether or not the opcode is still valid in 64-bit. Compatibility or legacy mode is, again, something we don't care about. Just telling you whether or not an opcode is valid in 32 or 16-bit mode. Like if you have an actual new 64-bit thing, is that backwards compatible? Backwards compatible, for instance. All right, and then the description is just a little simple description. This is where, for instance, if we go to the jump instructions, this is where it'll say jump not equal is jump if the zero flag, you know, is zero, something like that. So this is going to be a simple little description, and you know now we're actually using infix operators, if you will, right? So eax and zero x fffff. All right. So now here's an example of end where we actually start using the RM32. So I just moved down, I slid down our little window a little bit in the multiple forms of end that exist there. And so I said, okay, there's a couple forms. We have one that starts with hex 80 and then another that starts with 81. And we see, again, this is just one where there's ambiguity. It could be a 16-bit 16 ver 16 version or a 32-bit version, but just assume it's going to be the 32-bit version for anything you're going to see most of the time, right? Unless you're disassembling DOS things, something like that. All right, so we have AND with an immediate and then an RM8. And so this is just saying I'm going to have some sort of address which, you know, specifies memory and I'm going to go out to that address. I'm going to pull in that value. I'm going to end it with the immediate and then I'm going to store that back out to that address, right? And it's, I'm pulling in one byte because this is a byte. It's an RM8, right? So it's saying I'm going to have some 8-bit sized thing and I'm going to have an 8-bit sized immediate. I'm going to end them together. And then I'm going to save them back out to that same place that I got that byte from in the first place. Right. So that's the roughness here. That's the rough idea here with these RM32s and RM16s and RM8s and stuff in this instruction column. But then we have, you know, if we want to know how do I specify in bytes this, you know, if I want to write and, you know, brackets, EAX, 0x, FFFFF, 00, or something like that. How do I actually specify those bytes? Well, it starts with 81, and then there's something, this slash 4, we don't know what that is, and then it's followed by four immediate bytes hard coded into the instruction. So the question is, what is that slash 4? And unfortunately, I can't get into that in this class because I have to go then show you multiple tables, and this is why I've treated the RM32, I just call it like, you know, an RM32, but it's really this slash 4, for instance, could be one byte, it could be two bytes, and the combination of those are what lead to those increasingly complicated base plus scale, index times scale plus displacement, right? 
So a simple form of that might just be one byte. But if I want to then get complicated, then it may turn into two bytes plus a displacement or something like that. So that's why I'm uh, not going to get into that here. Yep. Um, so I noticed that there are a couple of commands that have the same initial op code. Yep. Like jump and call that are distinguished by the slash three slash four slash right. five. Exactly. So that's actually data in bytes that follow the FF that we could look for? Or right. Okay. And so if I went to this table and I told you how to like look things up in this table that I don't want to go to into, right? So exactly. Like she said, you can have things where the only difference between instructions is whether this is a slash four or a slash three, something like that, right? And so what these slash four and slash three is, there's some table, and this can also be like a slash r. There's a table and it says if this is a slash r, you are allowed to pick any byte from this table. If this is a slash three, you may only pick things from this column. If this is a slash four, you may only pick things from this column. So that's where the difference comes. So a call and a jump may start out with the same two bytes, but then if the next byte is a byte which is only in this one column of this other table, you know this must be a call or a jump, right? And if it's in this one, it must be the other thing. So, so I can post that at the end and, you know, I'll let you guys uh, get working on your thing before I go into that, but so basically that's more complicated than you need to get in intro x86 class. I didn't bother to learn that until, you know, I wanted to explain it in detail to you and then I was like, I can't do it in this class. So. And so if we went to the man page, right, we had that table here first, right, right, this. We have this table and that's the initial thing. This is telling you all the different forms which are valid, right? So I just covered a couple of them. I said, I have an immediate that can go into EAX. I have an immediate which can go into just some arbitrary RM32, right? So I didn't tell you about this form when I had my simplified version. I didn't see it necessary to say that there is like a special form just to put it in EAX because EAX is the accumulator register and maybe we want to like put stuff in EAX. So there's one form where you always put it into EAX. There's another form where you can put it into any register, just some RM32. But that's a longer form, first of all. So that's kind of the only real difference here, right? This form can potentially be pretty long, whereas this form is like definitely just 25 followed by the immediate. This form, it must be at least two bytes followed by the immediate because this slash four has to turn into at least one byte, but it could turn into more bytes than that. So the simple form is smaller, like the limited form where you always go to EAX, that's smaller in terms of bytes. So if the compiler is trying to optimize based on size, maybe it would choose EAX in order to use that smaller form. But otherwise, there's the generic just move into any old RM32. And then we have forms like take R8, so this is like a register, move that into an RM8, okay? So if you need to move one byte from a byte from one register like AL into some arbitrary other register like CL, right? So for those EAX, EBX, ECX, EDX, right? They all had versions which were AX, BX, CX, AL, AH, BL, BH, etc. So if you want to move from one register, let's say BL, into either another register that's 8 bits or some memory location, and there's another form, et cetera. So, yeah. Oh, and then finally at the bottom, right, we have a form that has uh, an RM32 on the other side, right? So you can take from memory, so you do take some register and it with a memory location and put it back into the register. So this basically, the groupings of these basically is telling you what all the possible valid forms are. So as many unique combinations of these there are, that's how many AND types you have. So anyways, after that table in the first uh, part of looking at the manual, then there'll typically be like a description which explains the exact uh, details of this the instruction, any caveats, et cetera. Um, you know, it'll say, for instance, maybe this can or can't be used with the lock prefix. We didn't talk about the lock prefix, but it's basically just a way to like lock down the memory bus to 
provide mutual exclusion. So if I throw like a lock in front of an instruction, it says like the memory bus may not be used by anyone else while I'm doing this move to memory or something so that you don't like start your and and you pulled something from memory and then you had to register and you wanted to end them together. But oh hey, you know, it turns out like memory changed between when you were trying to get it out and put it back in or something like that. So lock is just a way to lock down for mutual exclusion. It's just a prefix that can be added on to certain, reg certain instruction and like the details may tell you, you can use this with lock, you can use this with rep, right? We saw rep before, that sort of thing. And then it'll tell you, you know, all the different flags that this can or will set or won't set, right? Like here it's saying, um, unconditionally, when you do an AND instruction, the overflow flag will be cleared and the carry flag will be cleared. So it's saying, you know, whatever they were before, it doesn't matter because afterwards I'm setting them to zero. So this is where, you know, if you really care what can all happen with flag setting and things like that, you have to go into the manual and you have to look into what can happen. Does the lock guarantee that a certain line or chunk of code is executed without interruption? Or? I wouldn't say it's, no, I don't think it's without interruption. It's the memory bus cannot be used by any other, uh, so if you have multiple CPUs, right, it's basically locking down the memory bus saying no one else may read from memory until this instruction is done. So if you're like in your critical region. Exactly. It's exactly for critical region type things. In operating systems class, when you want to make a mutex, you got to use the lock instruction in front of some sort of thing like an exchange or something like that. So exactly. It's for critical regions at the lowest level of like assembly instructions basically. Because if you, you know, you can say, oh, well, I have, this is my critical region and I grabbed my mutex here and I let go of my mutex there, right? That's at the C level, right? But what about that actual grabbing the mutex, right? That in and of itself is uh, something which can potentially be preempted in the middle as all the stuff's going on behind the scenes in the hardware. So anyways, here's that uh, JCC, one of those four pages of jump variants that I talked about. And so I just wanted to point out that, you know, one, you can definitely say that things are equivalent if they have, for instance, the same opcode, right? You may have different instructions, different ways to name an instruction. But something like, you know, jump if equal, well, let's see if they're on even the same page. Something that's on the same page. Find two that are the same thing. 72 and 72, all right? 72 here says it's a jump below. 72 here says it's a jump if carry flag is set, all right? So now we have at least some notion of what below means to the hardware. Below means carry flag equals one because these are the same exact instruction saying jump below. You would go over here and it says jump short if below. And it says in parentheses, well, to me, below means carry flag equals one. And you have the just a different mnemonic where you could instead say jump if carry. So that's where I was saying before, you know, when we have like those compares and we want to like put that abstract box between them and we say, okay, what's the next conditional jump? Is it a jump below? We'd put like a greater than sign. If instead we wanted to go through and figure out, you know, what flags does this compare set because what flags would the subtract have set? Then we could say, okay, did the subtract set the carry flag? Which it would basically if it had to borrow one, uh, but uh, I think. And so uh, if you want to do things straight up based on flags, then this will tell you what all the flags are that are checked when you're going to do some jump. But most of the time, I, like I said, I find it easier to think about below and above and less than or equal to and stuff like that. <coughs> and again, just some other examples. 77 is jump above. 77 is also jump if not below or equal, right? So above, the thing is not below or equal. And above, again, is signed, unsigned, right? Above and below are unsigned notions. Less than or equal are signed notions. And again, which, dis which mnemonic is actually displayed is entirely disassembler dependent, right? The disassembler just says, well, I see a 77. As far as I'm concerned, that's a jump above. And another disassembler may say, if I see a 77, that's a jump not below equal. There's really no rhyme or reason to that. That's just whoever coded up the disassembler, they got to choose what they wanted to display stuff as. 
All right. Now, did I go like too long? What time did we come back from lunch? So it's like almost three. And did I give you a break at two? Did I? Okay, good. All right. We're going to keep going. Here's just an example. So last night, you know, I asked you to do the homework where you go find some new instructions. <clears throat> and so the utility of going and reading the manual is for those sort of cases where you've, you know, you're just playing around. You want to find some new instructions. You want to figure out what is this doing? Like, so I created a new instruction by some combination of C code. And what's the purpose of this? What is it actually doing? Well, actually, Dave, I should say that behind the scenes, I looked up that 99 for years, and it's not actually a clear thing, right? So this is, I'll now do two examples of this based on the new instructions that came in today. Uh, but uh, we'll just start with this here. So if we go back to example six, like one easy way that you can potentially get new instruction is just playing with signedness or unsignedness, right? Because I said the hardware doesn't care. The compiler is in charge of generating the correct instruction sequence so that it actually outputs something which maintains signedness or doesn't care about it, right? So originally I had unsigned into A, B, C, and we just did like a multiply and divide, and those turned into shift right and shift left, right? If I turn those into integers, so signed numbers now, and I'm doing a multiply or divide, now the hardware has to generate instructions that say, well, if this A, B, or C turns out to be some negative number, and I'm like dividing the negative number, so I'm shifting it right, I want to make sure that it like doesn't have those zeros put in at the top. Because if I, you know, so if I have some negative number, if I have a signed number and it happens to be negative, like we'll say the most negative number, which was, you know, eight zero 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 zero, right? That was negative two billion, whatever. Negative two billion, right? So in binary, that's one zero 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 dot 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 dot. Right? Bunch of zeros. Take each of those, turn those into four zeros, right? If I have this negative two billion, and I want to divide this, you know, I want to shift this. If I shift this by two, it better not be zero zero one zero 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 zero, right? Because negative 2 billion divided by 2 better be negative 1 billion. Or, well, that was divided by 4. So let's uh, turn that into a divide by 2. Just move it one place, right? Negative 2 billion divided by 2 better be negative 1 billion. And if I put a 0 up here, that's definitely not a negative thing anymore, is it? Right? But if I put a 1 up here, it turns out that is a negative 1 billion still. So, this is where we get into, you know, I already kind of said this already yesterday, but if I change from signed to unsigned, all the assembly instructions are the same, but in GCC at least, it'll generate this shift arithmetic right. So it actually, even for the multiplies, the shift lefts, it doesn't care, because shift uh, arithmetic versus logical left is the same thing. But for shifting right, when we're dividing things, um, we want to make sure that we're using this arithmetic shift and so, whereas I said before, the shift logical right just sticks a zero at the top bit whenever you move it over, the shift arithmetic right says, what is your top bit right now? For the eight, the top bit is the one. And it says, if I'm going to shift you X number of places to the right, I'm going to give you X number of ones in the most significant bit. So that you, which were a negative number, stay a negative number. Because if I start putting zeros up there, you're not negative anymore. How to keep the one, one, you know, and keep moving it over. So that's one way you could, like, find a new instruction. And so here if we found uh, that we had this new SAR, right, and we wanted to figure out, okay, we generated SAR, what's up with that? Is that out? Oh. What's up with that SAR? Well, then we would go and we would uh, try to find it in the manual. We'd find a page like this, and this turns out to be both a shift arithmetic left, shift arithmetic right, shift logical left, shift logical right. We just call it shift. Up to you to figure out which is which. Actually, it probably says in the description. But this is the full uh, description. And let's see. Well, and I find the rest of this boring, so I'm not going to get into it anymore. I already told you, basically, uh, 
basically the only difference with it, right? If you went in through here and you like looked at the actual, um, well, I guess what I was saying here was, array, we learned a new instruction, whatever number this is, 25. So we now know shift arithmetic right. The only difference with this thing is, right, we put ones, if the most significant bit was one, we're going to put ones in as we shift over, right? With a shift logical right, we would put zeros always. We just put zeros as the most significant bits for each shift. And then you can go and read this on your own time. The detailed description of why exactly it makes like five more instructions when we're doing it signed. All right. Variable length instruction. See what else we got here. Okay, good. Okay, one last thing I want to talk about. Um, before we get into the choose your own adventure portion of this. Uh, so variable length instructions, we already talked about this a little bit. Um, we said, so now we know that behind the scenes, these instructions can be specified by one byte, two bytes, right? So push EBP, one byte. Move EBP to ESP, two bytes. So, this kind of has some interesting implications for security things. Um, most importantly, like the point here is, if you jump into the middle of some instruction stream, right? Um, if you somehow get the EIP to just like point at some place that is not actually the beginning of the instruction, CPU is not going to care. It's just going to say, I see this first byte is whatever, you know, that's the op code for whatever instruction. Therefore, I know now I have like one or two bytes afterwards, and then I have an immediate afterwards, et cetera. So the CPU really doesn't care, right? That goes back to all of our, you know, von Neumann architecture so that I can act like I'm cool because I know von Neumann architecture. Uh, data is code. Code is data, right? The CPU doesn't care. It'll execute data just like it's code. It'll just interpret it as a sequence of bytes because we said our code behind the scenes is just a sequence of bytes. So, um, one issue here is, well, let's say one very simple issue is, let's say I'm at an instruction and I want to figure out what was the previous instruction immediately before it. I have absolutely no way of figuring that out other than brute forcing it, right? So I have some instruction stream. Here I am in GDB. I'm going to, you know, <coughs> All right, so here I am at some random instruction. And I know that the instruction I'm looking at right now at this address right here, ending in BF, that's a pop EBP. Great. What's the previous instruction? Right? Okay. Was the previous instruction one byte before? Did it start at BF? Well, let's find out. I'm going to go ahead and take that address, copy it, x slash 10i. And then I'm going to put that address. And so I'm going to say, starting one byte before me, disassemble this, right? Do, except I didn't subtract one. Starting one byte before me, well, I'm even going to do it like this, minus one, right? Okay. When I did that, the instruction stream, it says, the, the correct instruction stream is pop EBP return. If I start one byte before me, now it's telling me that the instruction stream is or AL with 5D five five and then return, right? So that didn't tell me the instruction before me. That like modified what instruction I am and that can't be correct, right? So minus two. Okay, now I have an ink and an or. Well, I still don't have the instruction which I know I'm at right now, right? I know that I'm at a pop EVP. So any sort of disassembly that doesn't tell me pop EBP is probably wrong. Minus three. Okay. Now I got something. I got add and then I got pop EBP. So maybe that's right. Maybe there's an add instruction immediately before pop EBP. Or maybe it's not right. <laughs> right? Maybe let's keep going back. 
oh, well, okay, so add and then add. Okay, well, that seems like maybe now I have a little bit of confirmation, right? So I have at least two things that tell me if I just keep going back, eventually they keep saying that there's an add right before me. But maybe there's not. So I don't know. So the point is, I could just keep doing things like this and maybe eventually I could find something that gives me a completely different instruction immediately before the push EBP. Pop EBP, right? Where's I at? Now I'm very curious if I can find something different. It's within the realm of possibility, but it probably won't happen. So anyways, this whole uh, multi-byte instruction thing means that for any given memory address, even if I know that that is code there somewhere, I know this range is code, something is code there. I can't say necessarily where the instruction stream begins. Like if I don't have something that says like, well, they're jumping to that right there. Okay, well, if they're jumping to that, that's probably where the instruction stream begins, right? But if I don't have any sort of frame of reference and I know like a bunch of the blob of data is code, I can't necessarily say what the real code is, right? Because I can interpret it different ways depending on where I start. And the first byte may not necessarily be the best place to start. So anyways, this has a few implications like that, basically. Remember, back in those risk architectures, they were all nice. Uh, risk architectures, as long as it's aligned by four, these four byte instructions starting at zero, right? Zero, four, eight. So you could always say if something's aligned on four, that's the instruction that we're looking at right now. So this is again, you know, just an example of that. I can print five instructions starting at EIP and this will tell me this is my, you know, correct instruction stream right here. It's all in green. If I do EIP plus one, I'll get three instructions which are wrong. But then eventually one is, you know, the next two instructions turn out to be right somehow. They eventually resynchronize. If I do EIP plus two, I get two instructions which are wrong. And then eventually, you know, I get back to the correct stream. If I do EIP plus six, that somehow lands me at a sequence of bytes which eventually ends up in some bytes which cannot possibly be instructions. And so that, that's definitely wrong, right? Because it turns out that these are like FFs which are not valid instruction bytes. So, this kind of has some implications for um, doing things like, let's say you wanted to, to find out whether some code, let's say that, you know, you're worried about a buffer overflow and you think someone may be copying instructions into this data buffer and they're going to like jump into this buffer after a buffer overflow. How can, if you could potentially like disassemble them and like look at them, then maybe you'd say, well, this really looks like a normal sequence of assembly instructions and you'd like to stop that. You know, there are some things that try to do that. I've seen some vendors which claim to have patents on things which do speculative disassembly of buffers in order to see is there any shell code in there. Yeah. So anyways. All right. So this is the end of the basic stuff. Uh, this is where you better ask me some questions or you better know everything. So who's got questions? Anyone on the phone have questions? Anything from any <coughs> section? that you'd like to go over again. How do you feel about a quiz? Feeling good? Yeah? Well, I don't have a quiz. So lucky you. All right. If there's no questions, ask me no questions, I'll tell you no lies. Five-minute break. Come back. We're going to let you choose your